Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Derek McDonald. Today we have the PMC class of 1965, and they're here to give us a look back to see what it was like as a military college cadet. In the studio, we have Bill Allenback, Joe Carter, Bob Clifford, Kurt Vincent, Kurt Laffey, and Rock Muller to end the lineup. Well, if we want, we could start by stating your name, your class number, and tell us a little bit something about, your, about yourself if you want to go first, Bob. Sure, I'm Bob Clifford. Uh, my uh, cadet number was 152 in the class of 1965. Uh, I went into the military and retired in 1999. I worked for Homeland Security for five years and uh, all together. It was a great career and thanks to the school for that. You want to go ahead, Joe? Joe Carter, of course, 65. Uh, I went into teaching and coaching after I graduated from PMC. I coached in a high school for a couple years and I ended up coming back to PMC and coaching for a couple more years. Uh, got out of teaching, uh, there was no money in teaching at that time, uh, I think I made $4,000 the first year. Uh, so anyway, uh, got into sales, worked for 3M Company, then Rubbermaid, and then in 1981 started my own business as a manufacturer's rep. You can go ahead, Bill. Um, Bill Allenack. Uh, Cadet number was 15, graduated and went to flight school. Uh, was commissioned in the Corps of Engineers, but they needed pilots more than they needed engineers at, in 65. Uh, got to go to Vietnam a couple different times, uh, flying uh, choppers. Uh, full military career, retired after 22 years uh, in 1987. Uh, doing uh, engineering most of the time, had a great bunch of different Assignments. One was uh, most memorable, I guess, was teaching at the, at the military academy at West Point. That was uh, quite an interesting tour to see that and compare it to uh, what went on here at the PMC. Thank you. Go ahead, Kurt. Hi, uh, I'm Kurt Lafey, uh, class of 65, cadet number 694, which I guess like a lot of us uh, kept that number for out of shape cases. Uh, and now today with all the obvious things we're doing, with codes on the computer that stuck with me forever. I'll never forget it. Uh, I graduated, uh, commissioned as an infantry officer. I spent nine years in the Army between reserves and full-time status. Uh, served in the DMZ at Korea for a year. Actually, uh, I'm responsible for Pamela John, which was interesting as a 22-year-old. Uh, after I got out of service, I worked uh, in a couple different positions for uh, the retail trade, uh, vice president for Sears Roebuck and Company. Uh, left there and went to work uh, in the uh, painting industry for a paint manufacturer. And I met a, a friend of mine who retired from the Army just recently and uh, set up a service-disabled veteran-owned company working for the National Park Service, Department of Navy, and also the Army Corps of Engineers. So I'm still working primarily in the construction business uh, and having a great time with it and some really great clients. It's been a good history. It's been a, a, a great career for me, and I learned a whole lot at PMC. I'm Rick Mahler, uh, PMC 65, cadet number 601. Uh, had uh, two years uh, guard duty, served concurrently while I was a cadet. My roommate Max Gayer and I joined the Pennsylvania Guard. And uh, so when we were commissioned uh, second lieutenants, we had two, uh, over two years uh, experience. Uh, I served five years active service, uh, tour in Korea, tour in Vietnam. Um, was uh, responsible for uh, relocating uh, President Johnson's uh, archival material to the Johnson Library. I was uh, security officer of the Armed Forces Courier Service and I was President Johnson's uh, military courier. Uh, then I went into banking, uh, left banking as a vice president for uh, Bank One uh, Texas and am now retired. Wow, very nice. Uh, well, that was an interesting uh, look on things, but I want to go further back uh, before you guys joined PMC. If you want to go down the line, just tell me uh, sort of how you heard about PMC, talk about your hometown, and uh, leading up to the events before you actually enrolled in the program. Well, I was born in Indiana, but my father was in the steel business, and they decided to build a new steel plant out in Pennsylvania, so <coughs> we moved the family to Pennsylvania. And uh, was in my uh, uh, high school years that uh, BMI, Bordentown Military Institute, came into play. I knew at age 16 I wanted to be an Army officer. So Bordentown Military Institute and my family deciding they would support that was the beginning of everything for me. 
and I also had a few friends that went to Bordentown Military Institute with me and then also off to PMC. So I grew up in uh, Morrisville, Pennsylvania area uh, and now live in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where we moved prior to my retirement from the military. Let's go ahead, Joe. Uh, born in uh, Trenton, New Jersey, raised in Lamberville, New Jersey. Um, went to high school in Lamberville and uh, heard about Bordentown Military. Again, um, that's where I met Bob, and uh, it was recommended that maybe I should go there for a year of prep school to learn how to study better, and maybe it would even help me for athletics. So I went to BMI for a year, met some great people there. Uh, they had a recruiter from PMC that came on campus and gave a presentation to us uh, about PMC. Um, applied to, at that time, I wanted to make a career out of the service, so I applied to Norwich uh, Military College, Citadel, and PMC. I was accepted at PMC, and uh, it was the closest school, so that's why I came here. Let's go ahead, Bill. Uh, I did not go to BMI. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I was born and raised in New York. Um, transferred to PMC uh, from Worcester Tech. Uh, not really sure how I heard about it, uh, but the military environment just seemed a lot better for me. Uh, more structured and uh, was able to do uh, lots of different things here. So enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. It's an interesting subject. I was uh, enamored, I guess, by the uniform. I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I got the brochure on PMC, and it, it looked like a great place to attend. And, uh, and I liked the idea of becoming in a, a career officer at the time. Uh, also, uh, Clarence Small, who was the president of the college, also uh, belonged to the church that I belonged to here in Springfield, Delaware County, which is not too far away. Mm. So uh, I got to know him and his family and he, he uh, talked it up and so I came for the interview and it just uh, something I really wanted, I desperately wanted. My parents uh, graduated from Cornell and they encouraged me to go there but I was uh, just dead bad on coming to PMC. I, I loved it and it's been a great, great opportunity for me all the way around. Very nice. Uh, when I was in high school, I was in a uh, paramilitary uh, organization in New York City called the Knickerbocker Grays. I got the military bug then. Uh, I started uh, after high school, I, uh, after graduation, I started at VMI. Uh, had a medical problem, uh, left VMI, was not uh, permitted to, to be readmitted uh, for health reasons, and uh, applied to the Citadel, was accepted, applied to PMC, was accepted, and PMC was obviously closer than, than uh, Charleston, South Carolina, so I decided to go to PMC. Well, now, um, now that you're in PMC and you've, you've sort of started your freshman year, are there any events leading up, any memories that you, uh, that you acquired? We can go opposite down the line, but uh, do you have any good memories that you want to talk about? Well, best memories uh, at PMC have been four years uh, uh, in the band, uh, but uh, you talked about freshman year, which we call our rook year. Uh, rook year was uh, really hell on wheels, uh, but uh, we we got through it, uh, we, we uh, cooperated, we graduated, uh, worked together. Um, um, most significant thing for me at PMC with the band uh, was uh, winning the national championship uh, uh, as a ma national championship marching band in 1965. I think the most important thing for me was the, camar the camaraderie that we built, the, the brothership, brotherhood that we have developed, which is evident here today. Uh, we have some 50 people from our class attending. After 50 years, I think that's quite a statement. Uh, there, there's so many benefits that we learned from the military leadership. Uh, but the, the honest thing for me is just the friendship and, uh, and the, the guys that I spent the time with for that four-year per, four period of time. I think the, uh, the structure and the, uh, the cadet life uh, proved that you could do more than just study. You could, you could also have play sports. Uh, you could be active in the hierarchy of the, the cadet corps as well as uh, exceeding in academics. There's a way to fit it all in if you're organized and, and, and uh, I think that's what I learned. Besides what Rick uh, has said, the, the camaraderie and Kurt, the, uh, I guess the brotherhood that followed us through PMC and then into the military knowing that 
the, the common heritage and you could trust each other. Now, Joe, you, uh, you played football and you did a little wrestling as well. You want to talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you have? <laughs> now, I, uh, football was obviously my favorite sport and I really enjoyed it. And uh, all athletics, I, I think, uh, just, just helps the individual prepare for life and uh, be more persistent and never give up and that kind of thing. And yes, I did wrestle and I ran track also, but that was more or less to help me and get better for football. So I, I just enjoyed everything here. I was going to say that the thing I remember most is, uh, is getting up at three o'clock in the morning and going in cold showers and having to do 50 push-ups. But uh, that I will never forget. But I think the most memorable thing to me was playing uh, at the Boardwalk Bowl, the Little Army Navy game, indoor, mm. um, that was that was a thrill. We didn't win my senior year. We came close, but um, also, as everybody else said, met a lot of friends, uh, great camaraderie, and still continue those friendships throughout the years. And Joe left out the fact that he was the most valuable player uh, in the Boardwalk Bowl, which was <laughs> a long time uh, ago. significant. A long yeah, it was a long time ago, but it was there. Um, I guess the thing. Uh, there are a number of things that strike me about our, our plebe year and the rook year. First is that we came in, uh, we matriculated, I can remember the day, we had high expectations, we saw all the soldiers running around in their gray uniforms and it was exciting. Then the parents left campus <laughs> and it went very quickly to intimidation and subordination. Uh, so in one day's time we went from civilians kind of with no idea where it was going to be and in really deep stuff by that late afternoon. But I think that was uh, probably one of the, the most important parts. The other thing I think is critical for uh, having gone to PMC is it was all male and we had the benefit of the classes of 62, 63, 64 and our own class uh, to learn leadership uh, and how it's done in so many different ways and how we can personally turn our strengths into uh, how we perceive and, and, and carry out our leadership program. So I think PMC was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk about the extracurricular activities, but uh, during the actual school year, do you guys have any specific professors you remember? Or any, what was it like during the school classes and all that that you guys want to sort of shed light on if you want to go down the line? I could remember uh, one particular, anybody that was in the English department remembers Homer Nearing. Homer <laughs> My uh, plebe year, my freshman year, I took a course in Shakespeare, signed up for it. Homer took me aside and said, it's a senior level course, you can't take it. And I said, they said I could. He said, it's a senior, le senior level course, you can't take it. Well, I took it and I did very well, had great grades. And I flunked because Homer Nearing said, it was not a freshman level course. Wow. <laughs> so that was, uh, of course, I had to explain that to my father who wanted to drive down here. But Homer Nearing really, uh, in a lot of ways, stands out to me because he did become a mentor as well. And actually, by the time I graduated, he wanted me to, to teach college uh, literature, which I really didn't have any intention of doing. But also, um, uh, Henry Phillips, the, uh, um, he was our PMC. PMS. The PMS. Uh, he was a pretty strong influence, particularly in my, uh, in, in my first class year when he told me that my first choice was uh, MPs, my second choice was to go into the engineers, and my third choice was infantry. And he sat me down and he said, I had three great choices, but they were reversed. <laughs> so I became an infantryman. And God bless him, he was right, that was where I belonged. So yeah, I do have some very strong memories of some of the people, and Homer and Colonel Phillips were really good. I don't know how I could forget Homer Nearing because <laughs> I got to know him very, very well. Uh, I took Shakespeare three times <laughs> <laughs> before I passed it. Uh, so I think he maybe just wanted to get rid of me and saw me enough for three years. So uh, he finally did pass me, but yeah, that, that I'll never forget. I uh, don't know Professor Nearing. Uh, I was an engineering major, so I. I'm, I guess I'm glad I didn't have. <laughs> he was also a doctor of engineering. Oh, well, that wouldn't have happened to me with, yeah. with English for sure. But yeah. um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the engineering faculty, there was a young professor, he's now a doctor. Uh, uh, Bob Kerner encouraged us to 
go take our EIT engineering training exam uh, as we graduated, and uh, that was that was a good uh, a good thing to do. Um, the Commandant staff, uh, I was fortunate to meet some different people, um, and with, with General Biddle in particular. Uh, I remember him, uh, the first good counseling session I ever had was, I, we welcomed the, the plebes in one year, and I said, if you don't like it here, you can leave. Well, that was the wrong thing to say at that, at that time, <laughs> so uh, he counseled me up one side and down the other. but. Uh, Kept in touch with him and saw him after he retired, and, and I guess I retired, uh, he and his wife. We were friends. Uh, Gene Cloud, there was, a, there was a sergeant in the, in the yes. admin office mm -hmm. or something. You know, he could be very ferocious, but I, I think he had, probably had a real good uh, fair streak in him as well. So that, a couple of folks I remember. I was a uh, business school major, uh, major in economics, but I took a lot of classes in accounting. And I don't believe it was any one professor that encouraged me to do that, but uh, that's gone a long way in my lifetime uh, because in, in business, uh, it's, uh, there's nothing like a financial statement. That's, I guess, what all private businessmen uh, try to attain is making a bottom line profit. And it's something, that very valuable lesson I learned through the total uh, instructors program and classes I took in the business part of it. Uh, the other thing, uh, Dr. Sophocles, do you remember him? Sophocles, Sophocles, uh, in philosophy, and uh, one thing he taught us was a word called synombonum, which I guess is a word for free choice in Greece, or in Greek, and it in essence gives us the ability to make choices for ourselves, and that's something we've had to do all of our lives in many different aspects. Uh, in the Army, we were taught that you had to make a decision, right, wrong, or different, make a decision. That, that all came from probably that class of where I first learned it, and through my entire career, I've, I've made decisions. And uh, that's what I would encourage anybody listening to the show today to do. Stand up for yourself and make a decision. Uh, maybe not always do what's right, uh, but make a decision. And uh, that's probably one of the most important things I learned at school. And don't be afraid to fail, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think probably uh, beside uh, Homer Nearing, uh, whose uh, signature uh, course was hotel, and at first I thought, First, when I heard hotel, what is this hotel management? No, it was history of the English language. And that was, uh, that was a rough course in our senior year. Uh, also, I remember Dr. Sophocles as, as well. Uh, uh, he and, uh, and several of us uh, went in the summer of our sophomore year, our, our third class year, to Greece, where uh, we toured Greece. We were guests of the Royal Hellenic uh, Military Academy. Uh, for their commissioning services. We got to meet uh, the king of Greece, then uh, King Paul. Um, uh, that was a terrific experience. But the greatest, I think, influence on, on me was Captain Douglas Detley from the uh, ROTC staff. He was a West Point graduate. Uh, he just uh, exuded uh, leadership uh, and leadership by example, and he was the greatest uh, influence upon me to uh, attend uh, uh, Ranger School and earn my tab. I'd like to add one more thing. I yeah. think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the coaches uh, that I played for. And, uh, in their own right, each one of them was outstanding, and I learned something from all of them, and that was uh, Coach Hansel, who's a legend here, um, Rock Royer, who was phenomenally uh, enthusiastic type coach, and uh, Art Ramo, who was more of a gentleman type coach, but from each one of those guys, I learned a lot that carried through my life. Well, that's, that's very nice. Um, I was gonna say, like, how have you guys kept in touch with other PMC graduates? Because obviously they all couldn't make it here today, but uh, do you guys write to them, or what, what exactly techniques would you use to keep in touch with them? Well, I'll tell you what, it's probably been one of the things I've been most remiss, because I had some of the strongest relationships and some of the best friends that, uh, in the four years, but I can't say that um, with all the moving around that I did over the years that I really took the time to stay in touch with them uh, as I should have. And shame on me for that because, again, we see each other and it's like going 50, 50 years back because we remember each other that well. And these are friends and I'm, I've got to make a concerted effort uh, uh, to reach out and stay in touch because we've lost some of our classmates and some of them were very close friends. And I didn't find that out until later, which means that 
um, I need to do a far better job in staying in touch with my real friends. And I think we can all say the same thing. There are a couple that I have kept in close touch with, uh, guys I played ball with and, and guys I didn't play ball with. But um, uh, yeah, that's important, Bob, and, and uh, we should all try to do a better, better job, job at that. Concur, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, we, we kind of be voyeurs and, and see what everyone else is doing and monitor, but uh, very, very few for me, uh, personal contacts. Uh, Roger Nichols up in New Hampshire, we, we get together occasionally. Early on, Dave Rittman was in the flight program with me and we flew together in Vietnam and Clayton Rash, uh, we were also, he was in a fixed wing company. We, we, we're in touch for a while, but uh, what's what the folks have said, it's kind of by the by, and we need to do better. Yes, we do. I think with life, uh, high school, college, uh, businesses, after you graduate, after you uh, perform a task and move on, uh, all of us get dispersed into different parts of the world, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, being on the committee, putting our program together for the class of 65, I've been able to reach out for the last six months to a lot of people that I felt as brothers, I felt very close to, and now seeing each other, it's just like we were here last week as cadets. Uh, I have been able to keep in touch with a number of people over the years. Uh, Fred Scheffler is not going to be able with us today because of medical reasons. He lives in Washington State, unfortunately. But I called him because I had an invitation to go to Kuwait and the first uh, plane really into, into Kuwait after the first war over there as a guest of the government to, to work on the oil cleanup, which uh, Freddie was involved with a, a uh, company that made an observant material in Washington State. So he and I actually went over there to Kuwait and piled around together for a couple of weeks and had a great time. Uh, and I've also had other business ventures that I've worked with other members of our class with over the years, and it, it's been wonderful. I just wish I could have done it with more of you. Hey, Kurt, were you active duty when you graduated, or did you go reserves afterwards? Uh, I was RA active duty for three years, and then uh, was in reserve for six more. Okay, right, very nice. And then, oh, sorry, go ahead if you wanted to uh, keep in touch with me. Well, um, with regard to contacting everyone. Obviously, we have our Christmas card list, but uh, besides that, uh, Andy Frazier uh, from a, uh, a younger class uh, started the uh, uh, headquarters company uh, Yahoo Group Site, so uh, a lot of bandsmen get together on that site. The uh, uh, Bill Spear and, uh, got this Facebook site uh, going uh, with Ron Romanowitz's uh, help. And so we see uh, a lot of activities on, on Facebook. Uh, the Wolf Graham Library uh, archive people are putting up photographs all of the time, and we're, we get to, get to see some of them and, and name the cadets. Uh, there was a picture of some cadets buying some uh, stuff at the canteen. And I remember seeing a picture of Dave Rittman and a, a few others. Uh, uh, the, the most uh, impressive thing uh, electronically, as far as I'm concerned, is Ron Romanowitz's remembrance site, uh, where anyone can log in and uh, on, uh, w without having to be in any special group and, and see PMC legends, our history, uh, class lists by class, and unfortunately, uh, all of the deceased class members showing all of, in each class year, showing their uh, graduation photos. So, um, yeah, there's a way to touch base, and, and fortunately, electronically, we, we can uh, start to keep touch that way. Well, uh, I think it's important to keep in contact with everyone, too. And um, I was going to ask what you guys think. Anybody can chime in here uh, for the traditions at homecoming, if there's anything you guys would like to see uh, maintained throughout as, as we progress. Well, I like broom drill. The I broom think, drill. I think yeah. that's that's <laughs> that's why you're in charge of it, right? Well, <laughs> it, even when we were cadets, that was always the alumni tradition. Uh, you, they used to back in the day, uh, uh, the before the alumni auditorium, there was a tiny uh, stone, almost looked like a log cabin kind of thing called the uh, the alumni uh, uh, hall or hut or whatever, but. Uh, uh, it was a very small office, and it was at the at the at the uh, at the west end of the Memorial Stadium, where exactly where the uh, alumni auditorium is. Uh, and the alumni, I can remember, they would they would line up at at the west end and just go have ranks and ranks of 
of alumni walking with their, marching with their brooms at half halftime. It's it's really a, a great thing, and I hope it, it stays. And could you explain that? Someone explain the broom drill just for everyone who doesn't know exactly what oh, it is and <laughs> where it came from. Uh, well, back in the day, uh, I think there are three generations of Hyatts, and I'm not sure which generation was in charge at the time, but um, that. Hyatt, who, who was in charge of PMC at the time, had requested uh, weapons uh, to be issued uh, uh, to, to the cadets because uh, he found, first of all, he, he found cadets wanting to drill together and, and he said, thought, gee, that was a great idea and they, he, he started the military program but they, they didn't have any weapons at all. So for them to properly drill with a manual of arms, required a, a rifle and so they weren't available but they were on order so uh, the cadets started to use brooms instead and so they would do the manual of arms with the broom and uh, so that's and th I guess they did it probably for a year before the weapons were finally issued and that's that's how that really got started. Wow that's, that's very cool. Um, are there any other traditions besides the drip broom drill that you guys took part in back, th back in the day or? I'll, I'll just I, say this. That, uh, go ahead, Kurt. I was going to say, I had one more thing. It had nothing to do with traditions at homecoming, but we had to substitute one other thing in lieu of a broom, and that was when we had to take dance classes in our uh, yeah. rook year, and we had to dance <laughs> with each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't can, remember doing you know, that. I don't remember that. Remember <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you dance <laughs> with some other guy. I was saying some with you, Joe. <laughs> I, <don't think> so. <laughs> I was just going to say that whatever traditions you retain and keep. I think the most important thing, because of all the lives that were lost in the various wars, and when Pennsylvania Military College started in 1821, I just think it's important, and Jessica and the alumni and everybody has been so helpful with us in getting everything organized for the, and I didn't do much, they did all the work, but I just think we don't want to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. We want to be remembered and just hope that the tradition of Pennsylvania Military College continues. Uh, what do you guys think about the PMC Museum that we set up here at the school? Have you guys visited that? Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's mm -hmm. great. Outstanding. Good. Perfect. Yeah, but we try to, uh, for ROTC, we try to put a cadet in there just to sort of make sure that they watch it and we have people come through there and everything. So uh, I was also going to ask if you guys have seen the ROTC program here, if there's any differences you've noticed at all? I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. I I was here a year ago for a, a first captain thing that Ron set up, Ron Romano was set up, and the, uh, the ROTC cadets were kind of the host and hostesses for us, mm. and uh, very sharp individuals, just they were, they were great, and then there was a little cocktail reception, and you, you could tell they were, part of their mission was to go grip and grin and mix and mingle, but they were all very articulate, very focused, very dedicated. Uh, they weren't wearing a gray uniform, but they had on the ROTC uniform, and I, I, I think that's a, that's a good thing to continue. Right, very good. Um, going back to traditions, did you guys have the battery and robinette drill back then when you guys were on the PMC? I don't, so. I don't remember that. No? No, I don't remember that. Okay. That's, that was another thing that we do here for the football programs, but uh, uh, we just basically have that for a tradition that we, that we do. I figured that was a, a good one to bring up to talk about, but... Uh, Yes, yeah, is, is there anything else that you guys wanted to sort of share f as far as memories that you guys had back then? For well, I, I can tell you one thing with respect to the value of, of being a commissioned uh, uh, PMC graduate. Uh, after I finished uh, uh, IOBC Airborne and Ranger School, my first permanent duty station overseas was in Korea with the 7th Division. When I got there at the end of 66, there were no senior uh, company grade officers. There were no first lieutenants. There were no captains. So when I when I arrived at at the 31st Infantry, there was a vacancy to for a company rifle company commander, and they picked me because I was a PMC graduate. The other two company commanders, the Bravo Company and Charlie Company commanders, uh, Dick Endicott was from West Point, and the Charlie Company commander was uh, uh, Chuck Craniac from from the Citadel. So. Only military college graduates were, and we were all second lieutenants, all butter bars. And it was a frightening thing to sign off for all the equipment and all of that. And so we became rifle company commanders. We were never platoon leaders. We just went right to the command slot. Then two months later, 
uh, Max Geyer, my PMC roommate, uh, was assigned uh, to Korea into the 32nd uh, uh, Infantry, and again, he was, he was assigned as a company commander, rifle company commander, as a butter bar, only because he was a, a PMC graduate. And the good news for, for Max and me was that when we had the AGI <coughs> inspection, uh, Max's company needed some gas max, uh, I needed some bayonets. We met halfway between Camp Casey and Camp Hovey, and I delivered uh, his gas mask, and he gave me some bayonets, and, and we, we got through the AGI, and then we re-delivered re everything back. And the uh, Uncle Sam, and don't tell anybody, but uh, we, we were able to get through the AGI that way. Oh, well, I was also going to ask, um, as after you graduated from PMC and you guys get your first second lieutenant butter bar rank, how was that? Working with enlisted uh, enlisted people that have been in for years, is there anything any conflictions that you guys had when you were first went in? You know, I'd like to, to talk to that for a minute. I think that the way we grew up here at PMC, starting from the lowest level and again watching the the leadership of the different classes and going through it ourselves, we not only had to have the uh, command and control, the authority, the rank, the responsibility, and those things that were required. But we lived together. So we developed relationships, sometimes high rank, low ranks, whatever. When it was time for military, it was time for military. When it was time for a relaxed period, we were well with each other. And I think that carried over into the military. I went into uh, the military. My first assignment was the 82nd Airborne Division. And I will say it's about as seamless a slide from one thing to another as I could imagine. It was not difficult. I didn't have any, um, you know, concerns. It just went right in and everything fit in. As far as the rank structure was concerned, you know, we'd gone through it all here. So my warrant officer was a key to me. The private was a key to me. All ranks were key to me. My job was to take care of all of them. And if I took care of them, they would take care of me. And that came from here. It really did come from here. So if I would say if there was anything in particular that helped make my military career successful, it was here. How do you feel you were prepared, Jim? Well, I was not in the military. Uh, for whatever circumstances uh, prevented that, um, I went into teaching and coaching, but I feel that the discipline that I had in five years of military school definitely prepared me for life, and I appreciated everything that that happened here at Pennsylvania Military College. Well, sure, the average person probably didn't have the type of training and the leadership skills that you had, so I'm sure that benefited you well in the civilian life, Absolutely. too. Yep. And then coming back to what Bob said, uh, if you take care of them, they take care of you. When you're flying a helicopter, the guy that told you it was okay to fly was a, <laughs> you know, an E-4 Spec 4 crew chief, and you, know, you strap that thing on and go take off and go do whatever. and. Uh, you know, they, they're trusting in you to bring them home safely and you're trusting them to make sure they put that safety wire on the Jesus nut the right way, otherwise, you know, no one's coming home. Mm -hmm. So it's a tit for tat kind of thing, as, as Bob kind of said more eloquently. Mm -hmm. I'm you, actually Bob. a little curious too for the flight school. Could you talk a little bit more about that and sort of how that yeah, works? Yeah, it was, uh, there was a, it was within the ROTC program, you were able to go to, uh, flight school, we went down to uh, Delaware, Wilmington, and we learned how to fly fixed wing. It, they, it was 35 hours worth of, worth of uh, Joe has an important call coming in here. Probably I'm still know. working, but I'm going to turn this off. The, uh, um, we went down to Wilmington, they paid, they paid for 35 hours of flight school, the ground school, and he came out with uh, a fixed wing reading. What it did was it obligated you then to apply to flight school when you <laughs> when you went on active duty. Well, guess what? In 1965, if you applied to flight school, you got flight school. Only it wasn't fixed wing. I got rotary rotary wing. So oh, okay. It, it was just part of the ROTC program. <laughs> great, great. I don't know if they still do that anymore or not. But wonderful opportunity. And your in your engineering uh, degree also helped with tremendously with that. Correct. Well, I was a civil engineer and not an aeronautical, but I, I guess, yeah, you understand about why things fly and wings work and things like that. But mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, the only engineering I did in the, in the uh, helicopter business was help do some surveying to lay out revetments, sandbag revetments for the uh, helicopters. That was my engineering in the <laughs> aviation right. business. 
Well, it's good that you learned all that while you were right. here, you know. Yeah. Just a, a little sidelight to your story there, Bill, and flying. I was at Fort Benning and I was going through airborne school and I ran into a friend of mine I'd grown up with who was a pilot and uh, they had a Huey uh, location there and we went down to, to look at the helicopters and he took me in to meet his company commander and I was a little intrigued by it. So I asked him, what, is it, uh, what does it take to uh, become a helicopter pilot? And he looked at me and he turned around and he had a roll of toilet paper up on the side wall. He took that off, he tore off a sheet and he said, sign here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, nope, this doesn't sound, this doesn't sound like something that I want to do. <laughs> now, Kurt, is there anything you wanted to I think one of the things that we learned at, in school was the leadership role. Mm -hmm. And part of leadership is the art of uh, delegating, both up and down. But one thing you learned uh, when you got on active duty very quickly is that your NCOs were paramount to your success. Uh, you could uh, be responsible. We had to sign off on millions of dollars of worth of stuff that half of us never even saw. We were talking about a helicopter last night that disappeared when one of the guys signed for him was all upset about. Uh, but the key is, is that the NCOs are the ones that really run the service. They're there more uh, than we are, in fact, on their specific jobs. We had a period of going in for six months and being promoted, transferred, whatever. The, the NCOs really run the service, and, th and th I have a tremendous amount of respect for them. Yeah. Uh, again, what Bob said was very true. We came up in an environment where we had four years of cadets. When we were seniors, we had NCOs in, the, in, the, in our third class rank, and then we had PMCs or uh, PF, PFCs or just regular cadets, I guess, that just came on board. So we had, a, we had that major experience over our years of having to delegate to people. And when we got on active duty, it was natural. But uh, you couldn't help but have a tremendous amount of respect for the NCOs and, and all of our units when he got on board. Well, sure, they had all the experience, and I'm sure that was that was good to sort of dive into. Uh, absolutely. And to, yeah. Is there anything you had to say? Uh, well, I echo uh, Kurt's uh, remarks about the NCOs. Uh, uh, I, I think the shining example of an NCO, of a terrific NCO, was uh, Master Sergeant Gene Cloud, who who really ran the Commandant's office. Uh, the, other, the NCOs and the ROTC staff were excellent, so we, we, we definitely understood the, the value uh, of the NCO and the value of working with an NCO, um, so they are the key. My sense is the greatest leadership lesson that we learned was to lead by example, um, and uh, I think all of us did it and did it well. Uh, I do echo your comments when, when I uh, went on uh, my uh, on active duty, to me it was seamless. It was take off, take off the cadet gray and put the army blue kind of on uh, immediately, or army green, d depending on whether you're going to address function or your class A's or or fatigues. But it was seamless. It was it was an easy transition for for PMC uh, uh, cadet graduates um, to 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 go from a being a cadet to, to a, a regular officer. It was excellent. I think that's well said, and I think that's a good way to wrap it up here. Uh, well, folks, thanks for sitting in today, and I hope you enjoyed this opportunity as much as I have. Tune in next time for Voices of Freedom.